I've got a confession to make. I need to get this off my chest. As a business owner, we all make mistakes. I've got to confess. I've got to confess. And we are live. It's time for another episode of Confessions of a Business Owner. But today I am joined by a very, very special guest and someone I call a friend, Ben Simkin. So Ben, thank you for coming on the podcast. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me, Charlie. I've been seeing your episodes come out. So I'm obviously honored that you've uh, asked me to come and have a look and uh, be on the podcast. Ah, oh, thank you so much. And it's really, I suppose, it started because of knowing you. The podcast has become one of these things that has developed based on some of the things I've been able to pick up from you over the years, and was actually formed by someone you introduced, uh, my fellow home. Oh, sorry, my fellow co-host, Kim Barrett. Fellow homeboy. Yeah, my fellow homeboy. I guess so. You could say you were part of the creation of the podcast itself. <laughs> well, there you go. Thanks. Yeah, it's really. Really, really cool. It's a great thing. So I'm just going to go over a quick thing here. So Ben Simkin, businessman, investor, and famous for generating $2 billion in sales from Facebook advertising. That's quite a title uh, in itself. You were one of the first people that was on the Facebook advertising platform. Um, you got into business at around 20 and launched an IT company, which you then grew, sold, and then went into the world of marketing through BusinessNet. Uh, more recently, you are the founder of, and how I came to know you, of The Mastermind, which I will say is definitely The Mastermind Group in Australia, one of the strongest co collaborations of, I would say, good minds in business in our country. So awesome way to bring you in. I'm thrilled to have you on the show from there. What are you getting up to this week? I can see uh, a fantastic backdrop of buildings in Brisbane. Is that your new development? <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, it's definitely not. It's uh definitely things are moving here in Brisbane buildings and uh, all kinds of things are happening here. And I think that's really exciting, not just for Brisbane, but for everywhere in Australia that things are really picking up and, you know, things are, there's a lot of investment happening in this country. I think this, there's going to be a lot of opportunities here. You know, we do a bit of, we do a bit of work in, in um, the United States and everyone always says that it's a land of opportunity over there because it's 13 times bigger and so on. But I think there's a lot of emerging uh, emerging markets here in this country that people should keep an eye on and see how they can get in, uh, you know, get in now. Because, you know, if you get in at the start, you, uh, you can do very well. I tend to agree with that one. And I don't know about in Brisbane per se, where you are at the moment, but in Victoria, the population's actually exploding. Like I can't believe how quickly the housing developments and apartment complexes are just I thought we'd eventually get to a point where it was like oversaturated, but the numbers are just growing and growing and growing. It doesn't seem mm. to be slowing down at all. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think it will. So as long as people fall in love and breed, I think we'll just keep going until we run out of space and resources. So hopefully that won't be for a while. I reckon we've got a good, uh, sorry, I reckon we've got a bit of time before that happens. So that's <laughs> way to go about it. But I've brought you onto the show today because it's an opportunity for you to confess one of your stories in business and talk about oh. how a potential mistake <laughs> has turned into a triumph. So I'll kick it over to you. What are you going to be sharing with us for today? Yeah, I mean, I could have, I could give you, a, I'd give you 12, 24, 36 hours worth of confessions uh, of all different scenarios, but I think I'll, I'll, I've got one in mind that I think ties in really well. Um, and uh, something that happened to me just over um, a few years ago now, it happened in 2013. And um, I, would always, I was always traveling over to the US and dumping a whole heap of money to get over there to go to events, not specifically necessarily for all the content, because I was already doing well enough in business, but I was, um, I was going there for the inspiration. I always got a lot of energy when I went to these things and was hanging around like-minded people. I'd get ideas, you know, someone will have an off the cuff remark and I'd be like, Oh my God, that's such a great idea. I would never have thought of that and then take it with me and use it in some of my businesses. But um, what ended up happening was I just came to the point where I was like, I can't keep spending 25, 30 grand just to go to an event for three or four days uh, and travel 24 hours, you know, each way to get there or 12 hours, whatever it is. Uh, it's just not sustainable. 
And so um, one of my mentors, he said to me that if you can't find some sort of a group in Australia, then you have to go and create one. I had no desire, no intention to create anything because I don't like, um, I don't like doing coaching and things like that. It's just not in my personality type to be able to be like that kind of person or a guru, if you will. Um, and so I created a mastermind group just so I could be around um, business owners. And it was a great way because I didn't really know that many business owners before I started the mastermind. So I created the mastermind in 2014 and um, got people like yourself and, you know, other people, just like really good people. Like that was one of the things that was like, we weren't going to let anyone in, in this thing unless we really liked them, unless they were successful, unless they were preeminent and all this stuff. So we, we, I just I was able to create a group of people that I would like to hang around with on the weekend. Like that's what it was all about. And so um, what happened was after the first year, I was like, oh, I don't know if I want to do this anymore. It's a lot of, it's a lot of work. But everyone started messaging me saying, oh, are we going to do this? Like, are we going to keep going next year? I'm like, well, I was planning on shutting it down because it was just a lot of work. And they're like, no, no, you got you to keep it going. And I was like, oh, okay. So then that's, that just opened it up and it's grown huge, like bigger than me now, where, where it's not just me at the front, you know, of, of the room helping people. Like everyone in the masterminds helps each other. Like we have people like you, like you're highly successful. We go in there and help people. And, um, and everyone else, you know, last, at the very last Sydney event, I, I didn't even speak that much. We had so many awesome people from the mastermind sharing the most amazing stuff. And so it's turned into something that I've always wanted. I wanted to be a part of, of a collective group of really successful, fun, awesome people that I like. Um, and I, I didn't want to be in a room where people I didn't like. And, and so that's, you know, that's, it's kind of like I didn't intend for the mastermind to turn into like a business thing, but it has just exploded uh, and definitely not through any planning of my own. So it's kind of like, I mean, is that a good enough confession? I like it. So the mastermind um, was created almost by accident or out of necessity of your own needs to not travel to the U S so often. Yeah. Because I mean, I'll admit, I get um, all the time a bit of envy towards the US and just the amount of quality speakers and businesses yeah. they get to be around so easily. Um, and I'm very thankful that um, you created the mastermind because if that wasn't here, then I would be in the same boat. I would have been traveling <laughs> to the US. We'd be traveling together. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> well, at least we could have saved or maybe sharing some accommodation or something. Yeah. It would have, you know, wouldn't have been too bad. But yeah, and the other the other cool thing is the other cool thing is um, a lot of the big guys from America like reach out to me and want to be a part of be a part of this thing because they've either heard of it or they've been into an event or something like that or they know a few members and they're like, wow, this is, and they say this is the, the most amazing mastermind I've ever been to or been a part of. They all say it, and these are the guys that are the top guys. We're talking like Alex Scharf and Bond Halbert, Jeff Moore, like. Um, you know, all the guys that I look up to are saying this, this is a special group. And, you know, I think it's a part of it is because it's not a commercial thing. It's never been like, how do we squeeze money out of people? It's always like, how do we create the best environment and just keep improving it? Because um, I'm a member of it just as much as, as you are and everyone else. Definitely. And I'll even say it has that appeal to it especially in that first year where I hadn't participated in a group like that, it certainly was a catalyst to meeting and hanging out with other business owners and really getting to experience what we would call the mastermind effect mm. or um, what is it? It's Napoleon Hill calls it the mastermind. Napoleon Hill, yeah. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. I mean, definitely you can, and he says it, I don't know exactly what the words are, but he says you can achieve more in a year with, you know, with the mastermind, with the mastermind, of the right people than you can in your whole lifetime. I mean, that's incredible. And I know that you've done some really big things with, with some of the members like Lynn and Kim Barrett and things like that. Um, just from meeting them through the mastermind. I've likewise, I've done things and deals and stuff like that, that I wouldn't have otherwise ever have gotten as well. Well, it's actually fascinating. I don't think I've ever told this story on uh, the podcast, but I will now is that you actually introduced me and Lynn together through the mastermind. And it was through doing your Facebook training. And this is a hilarious <laughs> thing because I'll never forget this. Is 
we were doing uh, training on Facebook ads and going through it. And it got to a point where Lynn Padetti, which is my business partner and outsourcing angel, came, um, we've just met and she was like, straight up, this is way too fucking hard. I'd really <laughs> rather you just do that. <laughs> and we partner. That was the birth. That was the birth of outsourcing angels, right? Yeah. Absolutely. And now, so, and now it's like a, a biz, big business, you know, it's going really well. It's, you know, you're delivering really good service to your clients. Like it's an amazing, everyone talks about OA, you know, I mean, it's like, Hey, who, how do we get VA? So like, well, talk to Charlie. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, that's the way it's certainly going. And I'm certainly no, noticing that we seem to get a lot more referrals um, by, I guess, developing that brand collateral yeah. and putting it out there, which has been a yeah. really good thing to have. Definitely. Yeah, absolutely. So when you look at this from here, did you have to make adjustments, I guess, to your own game plan in business based on the success and growth of the mastermind? Because as you said, it wasn't something you were initially intending to create, but I suppose it was a nice development. Yeah. I mean, I mean, obviously definitely um, it's been good from more of a point of view of, I just found like being around people like you and the other mastermind members, I've had to keep leveling up. I didn't, I was never allowed. I never could allow myself to, to take my foot off the gas and like either stop learning or stop pushing the envelope with my businesses and stop figuring out how to, uh, you know, obviously generate more income or acquire more companies. Like I never could stop or even learning about the new things with Facebook or Instagram or anything else. Like, you you can if you're on your own you can kind of like give yourself too much leeway and scope to say well i'm gonna you know just cruise for a little bit because like i need to keep up with everyone else as well so that was that's one of being one of the biggest things and i don't think i would have achieved everything i've I've achieved over the last four years without it i would have just been cruising along um kind of almost doing um I mean, I would always be doing a lot, but I wouldn't have done as much as I did just because I've, I'm, a, I'm a, in a group of peers who um, I have to make sure that I, I can um, hold my own and not be in the group where it's like, hey, Ben's the poorest guy in the group now. <laughs> you know what I mean? So definitely that from that side of things. Uh, and, and also, um, yeah, just meeting people, doing joint ventures and just having good friends like being able to talk to people about business and your challenges and your wins because you can't go down the street or talk to your old school friends about, Hey, I landed this million dollar deal today. They're like, cause I think you're bragging. Whereas you just want to be able to share your experience with people. And some people don't understand that that's fine. But if you have a group of people who are all have, they're passionate about creating, that's what you want to do. Cause then they want to talk about ideas and they want to talk about, how they're helping people and challenges they've got. And that's super powerful in itself. Yeah, I really agree on that point. So since starting the mastermind then, what's the most interesting thing you've seen within the group? Um, Most interesting thing. Most interesting thing. I would say the interesting thing is you have people who do, um, you know, good and they, they definitely all improve uh, their income and their, um, their mindset. One of the big things actually, just before I go on is one of my goals is I want to make sure everyone starts thinking differently in the group, you know, that because people have this like set thing, like this is how people think life, this is life. And these are the rules. This is what you have to follow. And I'm like, I want to break everyone else out of that and go, you get a, a lot of possibilities. That was one of the things I always wanted to make sure that everyone got on. I think everyone does that. Um, but one of the interesting things is everyone does well. They, they increase their income, they increase their knowledge, learning and confidence. Um, but there's a number of, a, a, a percentage of people who do extremely well, who, who kick, who really kick the big goals. And you're one of those people who are in the top, top percentage of people who just go and to succeed no matter what you do. And those are the people that, um, I mean, we've had one person in the group who's made, you know, I think $4 million over the last couple of years, $4 million in, in, um, in revenue. Uh, I think at a very high margin, like 50, 60% profit margin, um, who did like one of our trainings and didn't do any of the other ones. We have like 20 or 30 of them. And the biggest thing is like the, the thing is, um, those are the guys that are just doing stuff. They're taking a lot of, action very very quickly 
and they're they're keeping an eye on um, how that goes and then adjusting their course very very quickly as well, not just going slow and not getting stuff done. I think that's huge. No matter how much training you've done, because a lot of people have done a lot of the trainings and have done well, but haven't, you know, done millions of dollars yet. And so like, that's, that's a big, big, big part of it. If, if you can take action, that's a huge part. I mean, do you agree? I would agree on a huge level to that. And I find it very fascinating as well that some of the members don't come on the group calls or maybe don't come to the events, but they still smash it. And then others seem to be doing a lot of that and mm. really coming in there, but not taking as much action maybe, but still getting a result. But it's fascinating that the correlation is in between the two. Yeah, exactly. I think it's, I think it's definitely comes down to taking action, being open, being very, very open to um, doing things differently um, and very quickly. Like if you start, like when we start doing something, like we might I go into a new business or a new industry uh, and we start doing things because I think it's a smart idea um, and then it kind of doesn't go well, then we have to be very, very quickly to change how we're doing it very, very quickly and adapt to what the marketplace is telling us they want. Whereas a lot of people, not a lot of people, some people, you know, some business owners out there um, we'll just try and get this one thing working because that's what they wanted to do and just they'll never get, get there because they have this this roadblock that they have to just do this thing the way they want to do it. But you have to be very flexible. You've got to take action and you've got to be confident. Absolutely. But I think there's a really good point on the flexibility because often we see, and I'm sure you've come across these people as well, is like we'll come across a business owner and they're basically just trying to beat their way through a broken business <laughs> or a broken idea. Yeah, exactly. Trying to make it work. It's, um, yeah. it's painful to watch, I must say. <laughs> <laughs> and they don't want to listen. It's kind of like if you own BlackBerry and nobody was buying BlackBerry phones anymore, like you have options. You don't have to just try and keep, you know, like you said, just trying to throw phones at people and hopefully they'll, they'll use it. Like you've got to think about how do I adapt to the marketplace? And there's always ways around it. And you've got to think outside the square and having a group of people you can bounce ideas off is hugely powerful as well. I think that's why, um, you know, the mastermind is definitely um, helpful in that and just get people's opinions. But flexibility is huge. I think that, you need to be open to doing things differently and being able to take advice from anybody. Um, a, a good friend of mine, um, Bond Halbert, you know, he's like, I'm very good at picking up and listening to good ideas, no matter who they come from. You know, he, if, a, if, a, if a high school janitor came to him with a really good idea, he could recognize that idea. But a lot of these other people are like, well, if they're not guru status and then they're, they're not worth listening to, and they'll only take advice from someone who's like, got a following and i think that's a trap you want to you want to judge ideas based on merit not based on how many followers someone's got or how much noise they have because a lot of the times the guys that have the biggest noise may not have uh, much uh, substance behind them so you don't know you want to be able to judge ideas on merit alone it's a great point there as well i really um agree with that on many levels some of the best mm. ideas that have come into my world have been from unusual places or unusual places. <laughs> yeah Definitely. I still get ideas from everyone. Like I've talked to uh, my wife. I've talked to every single employee, no matter where they are in the business. I've talked to anyone and say, I'm probably annoyingly, I say, what do you think about this? And <laughs> every single person I ask, what do you think about that? Do you think this is a good idea? And it's like, because I don't want to be the guy that knows it all, but ends up not knowing anything. So, you know, that's a big thing. It's a great way to be open to it. So when you look at the average business owner these days, then what do you believe uh, they need help with or aren't doing as they should? Yeah, I think there's a number of things. I think that number one, you have to start with the base. You have to cut away a lot of the noise. Like there's a lot of noise in the marketplace. And it's like, if you, if you went on your Facebook feed and you bought every single course and coaching program and, and program, Ooh, we just lost you there. We'll just we'll chime back to the question. We'll go uh, from here. We'll just go, hey, Ben. <laughs> Come back to it. No, I'm kidding from that. So we were just discussing weird, weird. what you think the average business owner should be doing differently or is getting wrong at the moment. And we'll start from there. 
Yeah, I, I think there's a number of things that you got to worry about or think about if you're a business owner, you haven't quite, if you're not, if you're frustrated by it, if you're frustrated that you haven't achieved specific certain goals, for example, at least covering your overheads, uh, and then if not going to the next level, I think there's a number of things that, um, that they need to do. And just on that, before I go ahead, I think that's, I, I like being frustrated with my progress because it, it just drives me to get better and better and try and work harder and try and find different angles. Like sometimes I'll drive to the office. I'm like frustrated that some certain project isn't taking off as fast as I want it to. But I like, I channel all of my negative thoughts into positive, into positivity. But that's one of the things I figured out. Like negative thoughts are really good because you get, if you're anxious about money, you want to channel that and say, well, then how can I use that to motivate myself to let, figure out how to make more money? If you are uh, worried about customer service and it really freaks you out that you have staff uh, who may not represent you well enough, use that negativity into say, well, how do I make that better? Like I get, when I get frustrated by its progress in different areas of my life, I like, I'm going to use that because now I can figure out how to work harder on that specific thing. Like you want to use that in those negative thoughts. I don't know if that's a new concept, but that's what I, that's what I do. And um, I don't get hung up and like, it's kind of like people who complain about getting anxiety. And it's like, well, that's actually might be a good motivation for you to get somewhere in certain areas. So I don't know. I think you can channel those. Um, that's what, that's what I do personally. But I think there's a number of things. I think number one, that people, there's a lot of noise out there. If you go on every single workshop, educational course, mastermind program, whatever that's coming up on your news feed, you won't get anything done. I think you want to start with the basics. And it's kind of like when you are building a house, if you're laying bricks, you want to lay one brick at a time. So you want to get the first brick down and, and settle. Then you want to do the next one and the next one. So the first one is really figuring out what your marketplace wants. Um, you know, because everyone, almost everyone goes into business because they either have a, a passion or a talent around what it is that they're selling. Like when I first started my business, I had a passion and talent for fixing computers and running software. That's why I decided to go in the IT industry. Not because the marketplace wanted, wanted what I had to sell. Luckily, they, enough of them did. But you, you don't want to go into the marketplace based on that. You want to go based on what the market wants to pay for. That's, that's the number one thing. Because if you're selling something that you're good at, but nobody wants, it's kind of like if you were passionate about record, you know, vinyl records, you may not have a big enough audience these days to sell, sell them. But hey, I really, like, I really like vinyl records, but that's not good enough. The marketplace has to like it. That's the first brick you've got to put down. Definitely. And then obviously go on from there and, and figure that out, how to do marketing. If you can figure say. out how to create a customer, that's, that's the number one skill. It's kind of like if you know how to catch a fish, you won't get hungry. If you know how to create a customer, then you won't, you won't, um, you know, you won't go hungry and you won't, won't um, be broke. I know it sounds like a simple concept. Like when you've said that, it makes complete sense. But yet we see so many get this wrong and try and scale up businesses when they don't have that market or really the offer that will get people over the line. Yeah. And it just kind of gets ugly because they end up... Um, <laughs> No, but it's a house of cards strategy. If you've got a good offer and market, that's a solid foundation to build a business on. Mm. But if not, it becomes very, very fragile. And when you start adding in team members or trying to scale advertising, it's this huge amount of risks to take on. Absolutely. I think that's, that reminds me of a thing that um, at the last Mastermind event, um, Ed Dow came down, who, if you don't know who Ed Dow, is one of the top copywriters on the planet. Um, and he was, he was a men mentored by Gary Halbert, who was the number one copywriter of all time. So he was mentored by Gary and Ed Dale. It's interesting because I hang around Bond Halbert a lot when I'm in Los Angeles. When I was hanging out with Ed in Sydney, I'm like, these guys are so similar in that they're so forward thinking. Like they're like, they're like, hey, this is the next thing that's going to go off. And I'm like, wow, I would never have thought of that. And it's incredible. And so he was saying one of the really important things these days is what he calls, what he would refer to as virality. So it's like when you get a customer, um, then you have to make sure that your business can create a new customer out of that customer. It's like kind of like a, a ratio. So virality ratio is like when I, when I get 10 new clients on, what's my ratio of, of them um, attracting more clients to our business? 
So a lot of work has to be done on the back end to make sure you provide the absolute amazing service. Because when you think about it, when you go see a movie, it's usually because someone's recommended it to you. When you go to a restaurant, it's either because someone's recommended it to you or you've seen it on, on Yelp or Open Table and you've got a lot of positive reviews. It's like this score that you need to have that it's no longer, uh, I'm going to pay for leads and convert them. And that's how I do it. It has to be at a multiple now, which is the virality thing. It's like, I'm going to get a lead. I'm going to convert them. And then I'm going to turn that one customer into three or into one. Uh, that's super important. And if you don't have a good offer, if nobody wants what you're selling, like you haven't even, you can't even get past the start line of that, of that race. If you want to, if you want to get viral and you don't have a great offer, you can't even, you know, like I said, get out of the gate. It's, it's, you got to get a really good offer and people are going to be like, man, I'm in this program or I bought this product and it's amazing. And that's how, that's how, that's the next big thing. Like that's huge. Yeah. And I look at that a little bit further. So for business owners that maybe haven't gotten to that place where they've got that high converting offer or worked out their market, what's in your opinion, a really good starting point? Is it to go and read the Gary Halbert letters? Is it to go and spend some more time on, I suppose, market research? Where do you think they should start? Yeah. I mean, I think that you want to, you want to do a number of things. Number one, you want to be a student of direct response marketing which means obviously going back to all the guys from the last 135 years and studying how they did it. Well, if you look at, for example, someone like Robert Collier, who in 1930 sold $20 million worth of products through uh, licking stamps and sending letters in the mail. This is the Great Depression era. And he made $20 million just by selling products through there because he understood the psyche and the emotions of his target market. Um, not, not specifically um, logically, but emotionally what they wanted. And that, that's a huge driver is because when you um, want to communicate with someone and you, want, and you want to affect their behavior, you need to be able to, you need to, be able to affect their emotions. Um, and because uh, emotion, emotions, <clears throat> excuse me, emotions drive behavior. Uh, and then your brain backs it up with logic. It's not the other way around. So it's always how you feel is what determines your decision. And how you feel is a, is a byproduct of the context that you're in. The context essentially basically means the situation that you're in at the time uh, and all the variables that go along with it. You know, if you are, if you are a 40 year old male um, who has put off um, starting his own business, he's in, a, he's in a career that he's not satisfied with, he doesn't have the income that he wants, he feels the pressure every month to keep up with his overheads and expenses. He's slightly overweight. He doesn't get the attention from his family anymore. And he's, there's a stack up of, of things that create a context. There's a stack of things that happen in someone's life that create an overall context. That context creates the emotion in the human being, which then drives the behavior that human being he ends up going to buy a red, a red convertible and tries to impress young, young girls or whatever he does. So that's, that's what happens. So if you're a marketer, you, want to, you need to be able to change the context or adapt or adjust or shape the context, which is usually perceptive. So what that means is um, when, you have, when, you look, when you look through your eyes uh, and you have this, the senses that you have, um, you're experiencing the world perceptively, not, real, not, not in reality because you don't know what reality is because you can't. It's not possible for you to experience reality. You have to do it, have to experience it through filters that have been created over the last 20, 30, 40 years, however you've been born. And some of the experiences have been delivered to you through DNA from your ancestors as well. So there's a lot of that going on. Um, and so you need to be as a marketer, be in tune with your target market to be able to know where they're at right now, their context and how you can uh, change and adjust the context that will then create an emotion for them to be able to act on the behavior to buy your product or service. It doesn't sound easy. It's not easy, but it's, it's what you need to do. I'm just having a little bit of a giggle because uh, where I live in Brighton, Victoria, there is a lot of uh, red convertible Porsches in the neighborhood uh, that middle-aged uh, men do drive. So it's clear that, you know, that type of persona exists around me. So noticing <laughs> 
but it's vitally important to understand that stuff and be really able to connect with your audience or customer on that level because it can make a huge difference in the types of things you create or the services and products you provide. Exactly. That's why you have to get into the feeling of your target market. You know, when people say my target market's 30 to 40 year olds who live in Melbourne in Brighton, that doesn't say anything. That, does, that doesn't mean anything because then it's like, okay, well, let's put an ad in front of those people on Facebook. Oh, my ad's not working. I don't know why. If you understood how that person felt when they woke up in the morning or when they came home from work and their wife's ignoring them or when they go to the bus stop and they get called, hey, fatty, or whatever it is that happens, things happen. And so you don't know. You want to know how that feels, even if you're not that person. And you can use either your own, draw upon your own experiences um, or use the experiences of people around you so become a student of people's emotions. When you talk to somebody, whether it's a waitress at a restaurant, your Uber driver or your friend or your family or your partner, anybody, try to figure out how they're feeling right now. Try to figure it out and try to feel that for yourself. Uh, and that's empathy. And empathy is a survival tool that allows you to experience um, to a lesser degree to around 10, 15% of that person's feeling by observing them with your eyes and your senses. So for example, when you see someone's uh, shin snap and break on it, when he's playing soccer, you feel a part of that, like you cringe. And that's because your brain is allowing you to feel a part of that process. And you want to be able to adapt that, that ability to be able to feel how people feel. That's a really good analogy. It's like that when you kind of look and see that injury or maybe yeah, a replay like from a game. When you look away from the screen, it's like, oh my God, I can't watch that. That's <laughs> the same thing. So I want to loop back into something you kind of mentioned there as well is because Facebook ads is something you're certainly well known for. And you've mentioned in this comment already that, you know, often we hear people complaining about why their Facebook ad isn't working when they're simply just trying to target uh, middle-aged men in red convertibles in Brighton, Victoria. <laughs> But what is the most common mistake you see in marketing through Facebook ads these days? Uh, geez, there's a lot of common mistakes. Let's try and pinpoint like maybe one of them. Like, I mean, I think the biggest thing is like, I don't want to be out, be on repeat, but I think like not tapping into the emotions. It's like, um, ads that are like, do you want a free consultation or do you want, to buy my product it's like no i don't want to buy your product nobody ever wants to buy your product they don't they don't want what it is that you have to sell nobody ever wants what it is that you have to sell even if you sell bmws it's like well wouldn't want people, people want bmws no they don't they want to feel the status they want recognition and respect and they want to feel like they are um they're they're the guys that are hustling and 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 the power players that's the feels if they could get that feel anywhere else, they could get it. But it's you got to think what it is. What is the outcome of what it is that you sell and what is the feeling and emotion they get when they get it? Those are the things that you want to sell and talk about in your advertising. Absolutely. I think that's vital. The one for me I keep coming back to when I, I think because it was such a big lesson, it's something that sticks with you for so long. It's like whatever your biggest mistake is, you tend to see everywhere after that mm. because you've experienced it yeah now when i first came in uh to do some work with you and learn facebook advertising i was having some challenges with a few campaigns and you got me to read uh, well not even the whole book but essentially just read a chapter and look at a diagram from great leads by mm. eugene swartz about the levels of awareness now it absolutely changed the game <laughs> at the time I was in an advertising agency, but we got a significant lift on every account mm. when we understood that concept. So yeah. for me, I'm going to go in and say that I think most business owners struggle to communicate at the level of their target audience. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and that can come down to a number of things. Uh, obviously not being aware of the five levels of customer awareness. It's like, the five levels of customer awareness, she said Eugene Swartz, he first um, shared it in his book, Breakthrough Advertising, in I think approximately 1962 from memory, uh, which is this, the most seminal, most um, important book on advertising ever written. I'm going to put it out there, Breakthrough Advertising. And he talks about that. But that is one huge dimension of understanding somebody's con 
uh, context of of awareness. It's kind of like the guy who gets up and he's got anxiety. The forty year old guy goes by, goes and buys a red convertible. Um, he may not actually know why he's doing it. He might not actually be aware of it, uh, of why, of what the actual context. And most people are not aware of the context they're in. Most people don't know what's happening uh, around them. But if you know, as a product seller or service seller or business owner, um, then you can tally your marketing, like you said, uh, based on the five levels of awareness. Uh, that's it's hugely important. Now I'll make sure to include in the show notes with a link to the book and possibly even the diagram, um, which I think is super helpful, but that's uh, breakthrough advertising and another book called great leads. And I think they're a yeah. must read. I'm not even going to say for marketers. I think every business owner should read them. Absolutely. Commonly help them. Yeah. Well, I mean, speaking of which um, there's this really cool thing that Dan Kennedy gets to do at his seminars and he, and he asks every there's chiropractors and there's dentists and there's vets and there's, accountants in the room and he says okay cool i want you to tell me what business you're in and they all put their hand up i'm a vet i'm an accountant i'm a dentist and he's like you're all wrong you're in the business of marketing (laughs) so every business owner has to be in the business of creating customers that's what business is you know what you actually do for them is is secondary and how you do it is secondary the first thing you have to do is be able to create a customer customer being somebody who pays you money Otherwise, you're going to have skinny kids. (laughs) Definitely on that one. So you've been in Facebook advertising a long time. Like You were certainly an early adopter in this field. How have you seen Facebook advertising change over that time? What's the big things you've noticed? Uh, I mean, I guess the, the big thing is if you want to encapsulate the whole thing is Facebook's philosophy on advertising. A lot of people don't know about this. Um, and that what um, Facebook's whole philosophy is the one is they want to be preeminent towards advertisers. And nobody in the history of advertising has ever been able to do that. Albert Lasker is probably one of the ones that I would think about has done David Ogilvy to a certain extent. Um, but um, Facebook's the only technology company in the modern era to have a preeminent philosophy towards advertisers. And that is that, that they want to help advertisers create more effective advertising. They don't want to, overcharge advertisers they want to create tools and systems and artificial intelligence to help advertisers sell more product and in turn the advertisers are then going to be preeminent towards their clients by providing great valuable ads enjoyable ads to the right people um, in front of the right people and not in front of the wrong people and have a more enjoyable experience for the end user to not be bombarded with advertisements that they're going to get annoyed with and so Facebook's whole ad uh, division is geared towards how do we make this better? I'll give you an example. Do you remember the company DoubleClick? I do. Ad Network? They, they used to run, uh, create banners and, and things like that that made it look like um, it was just a link to an article or a, another part of that website. They used to try and trick people into clicking on the ad um, on um, nefarious terms. So be able to people were clicking on the ads thinking it wasn't an ad. Double click would make it, you know, money out of it because it was pay the click. Uh, but then the, the experience for the user would be terrible. Uh, that would click off the advertisement, the advertiser or the company wouldn't make any sales from that, from that click. So all in all is terrible experience. Facebook recognized that and they said, we don't want, we don't want to run a network like that. If people click on an ad, we want a hundred percent make sure they know it's going to be an ad. That was one of their big things. They don't want people to accidentally click on an, an ad thinking that they're on Facebook. That was one of the big things that they started off with. And now um, with the artificial intelligence, they're creating systems to help us get in front of the people who are more likely to buy from us than anyone else. If there's a million people in your, in your demographic for your product, Facebook can tell you the 24,000 people 24,326 people uh, in, that, in that million people are more likely to buy a product than the, than the rest of the people. Now, it doesn't give you those names, but it, it, it serves that ad to those people. And so that's another way that they do it. And there's no one else doing that. Google is starting to do stuff like that. But I think because of Facebook's overall 
philosophy. Um, they're going to be here for a long time to come in some shape, way, shape or form. Um, they're going to be here for a very, very long time, at least for their advertising systems. Uh, and how that plays out, I don't know, but they're going to be here for a long time. I would agree on that one. Uh, they certainly were massively ahead of the curve when they came up with like interest-based targeting um, or behavioral type targeting and things like that. But um, even with the recent challenges with like the Analytica saga and all the rest, they're still coming through stronger than ever. And I think we'll yeah. be here for a very long time. Absolutely. Yeah. So I guess what we'll look at from there then is that what do you think the most effective strategies on Facebook or any platform in marketing really are today then? Yeah, I think that number one, that any, any advertising you have, you do has to be um, valuable. So it has to benefit the person interacting with your advertisement and it has to be entertaining and enjoyable and entertaining and enjoyable experience. So it has to be not only valuable, whereas they get the person gets a, a, a benefit from interacting with the ad, whereas a lot of business owners think that they only going to they only want to give a benefit after the customer or client pays. Your ads have to give a benefit. So if I'm doing an article, I want to give some tips on, um, you know, things that you can do uh, to improve your marketing. Or if I uh, am selling a product that that usually has some level of uh, anxiety, stress, or worry um, around um, doing, like you could be buying your first home, for example. Um, there's a lot of anxiety around that. So I wanna be able to figure out how do I diminish anxiety to, a, to whatever level by through my marketing. And one of those ways you can do that is through hope. So hope is something that everybody wants. Everyone who wants hope that they're gonna be in a good position in the future. And so you want to be able to say, how do I instill hope in my target market? One of the ways I could do that is I can have video testimonials illustrating that they can be in the same position as my clients who've had great results. That's just one of like a million examples. So maybe you want to, if my target market is anxious or worried, you know, if I'm a rehab clinic, um, there's common beliefs around number one, um, it's hard to quit drugs, alcohol, whatever it is that they're doing. Um, number two, that you need help to do it. Number three, um, that um, that it's impossible. Like there's, there's a lot of mis, misperceptions around addiction. So um, you want to be able to instill hope in those people uh, by doing different things. And your, market, your advertising should be an enjoyable and valuable experience, not after the client pays, but as soon as they interact with your ad from, from the very second. Um, the person who actually comes to mind when I'm thinking about addiction, because there's a lot of misperceptions about addiction, a lot of a lack of hope. You know, if you're addicted to drugs or alcohol, there's a lack of hope in your situation. You feel hopeless. Um, and so this is another thing. It's like I'm drawing upon experiences. How would I feel if I had to shoot up on heroin every day? I've never done it, but I can, I can draw that. I can feel that. I mean, don't you think? Absolutely. And I was just thinking you dropped so many nuggets uh, of gold there for anyone that's listening is that if you're going to provide, and I'll just repeat them because I, I have to give them away. We can't be teasing. <laughs> that if you're providing a valuable entertain an entertaining experience in your marketing, so if there's value from the start in your marketing, it's not something people get better. If you're instilling hope in the journey, so if you're showing what the before and after is of someone that comes to work with you or uses your product and service, and on the other side of things is really, really clevering, sorry, really, really cleverly putting it all together into um, a hope scenario and understanding yeah. the side. Yeah, Very that's, that's, just one of the, that's just one example. There's a lot of things that you have to do to think about how can I make this experience enjoyable and valuable and a lot of people get think that oh, I have to give away all my content. I've got to teach people stuff. But a lot of the times people don't want to be taught stuff. And it's like when, so I give the example of a, a rehab clinic that I want to teach you how to get off because that's not going to help. It's not going to be valuable or entertaining or enjoyable for them to do that. It's not an enjoyable process. It's like you want to, I'm going to say, well, what am I, what is my target market going through right now? They feel very hopeless about this situation. It may not be that. I mean, when you go buy an iPhone, you don't feel hopeless about buying a phone. So it's not the same scenario. It's a different scenario. 
So you've got to adapt to your client's um, or target market's context. Uh, one person does that really well is um, uh, Russell uh, Brand. You know, he helps people with, with uh, addiction issues and his messaging is so on point. If you go, when you go back and have a look at his stuff, because I'm sure you're going to, you're going to start to realize that he's in a lot of the stuff, a lot of those live videos he does and snippets and things he does and the experiences that he provides to you through his Facebook and Instagram is one of the things, key things he's doing is instilling hope in his target market that they can, what he calls, unfuck yourself. And it's like, that's his core message. It's that that didn't come about on accident. He's actually wanting to put hope in you because when you are an addict, you need to use, you need to have that feeling to then act on, you know, uh, rehabbing, right? That's, that's the whole thing. He's wanting to make you feel a certain way to then go and do something. And he's not an idiot. Well, I'll tell you what, he's so on point that I've actually questioned um, because he looks so natural when he does it. It looks so unforced. There's so much authenticity. Yeah. I often wonder if that's just him or if he's been trained or aware or he's intentionally bringing that type of emotion to things because he does it yeah. brilliant. <clears throat> he does. And I, I think that you don't have to be trained. I think some people can naturally be, if you're a very empathetical person, you always, in every interaction, you're always going to, a phone call, an email, a meeting, or hanging out with your friends, you always go into it and you think about how is that person feeling? How can I affect them in a positive way? What am I going to say? What am I, how am I going to act? These are all the things you want to go internalize because you actually care a lot about the people that you're interacting with. And I know that he cares a lot about um, his target market because he was his target market and he knows how it feels. And it comes across, across so genuine as well. And I'm sure you've had an experience much like I have is that when you, uh, let's say speaking with a business owner and they're trying to sell you a product or service, I can almost feel when it's in their own interest or within my interest. So I can tell if they've got bills to pay Absolutely. or if they're wanting me to have an enjoyable experience. And Russell's the best example of like, he is so authentic. Um, where you can tell he's got your interest at heart. Yeah. Not his own. yeah, exactly. And that's the only way you can succeed. You know, it's the strategy of preeminence or it's just being a decent human being, actually really, really, really caring about the people you, you serve. You're like, that's number one. And then the money will come later on. You don't try and nickel and dime people. Just try to help people and try to give them value and the money will come back to you. That's, that's all you have to worry about. Absolutely. If you're creating quality transformations and serving people at a great level, that is fundamentally one of the principles involved in having a good business. Yeah, but you don't want to serve people the way that you want to be served. You want to serve people the way they want to be served. It's like there's a golden rule in the Bible that says treat, uh, it's something like treat um, other people as, as you want to be treated. Well, I don't like that because, you know, that doesn't really make a lot of sense when you think about um, you want to be treated, you know, in a specific way with a different product or service. I would want to be treated differently. Um, so you have to uh, treat, treat people as if they, the way that they want to be treated um, or even maybe, maybe they don't even, not even aware of how they want to be treated. Like with the, the rehab example is a great one because it's like, they're not aware that they, they're living the experience of being hopeless but they don't think about that. So if I'm like, if I'm in tune, I'm like, well, I want to, I want to be able to affect their emotions in positive ways to make, to take action. Definitely. So let's talk about your 2018 or what you're working towards in the future. Then what's on the cards for Ben Simkin? What are you trying to take down in this year? What am I trying to take down? Yeah. Um, so, um, so, I just envisioned you for a second. It's like whatever Ben Simkin puts his mind at is like, you know, uh, some sort of athlete tearing towards <laughs> and just tailing to the ground into submission. <laughs> Too funny. Uh, you know, biggest thing is obviously, you know, we spend a lot of time thinking about like every day, our teams are always talking about how can we improve our service on, on every site, on every business. So that that's a big goal. It's always like we noticed that, you know, this, this could be done better for the benefit of the client. That, that's a huge thing that we do all the time. That's, that's a big priority all every day. It's like, how can we do better and better and better? Not, not how do we 
uh, how do we make more and more and more money? It's definitely not a conversation we very, rare, very, very rarely have. It's more about how do we, how do, we do better at, at serving? That's an important distinction um, that everyone should take on board. It's it, because we, our, our KPIs are based on um, how, how well we can do and what cool things we can do to help people more and more. Um, that's a big thing. Um, and obviously the other things that we do is we acquire um, where we acquire or mostly invest in companies that we think are doing good, that have good products, have good teams, have good management, uh, and we'll invest, put capital in those businesses, um, give them some advice, not necessarily tell them what to do, but give them um, tips and things that they, you know, um, avoiding pitfalls and helping them um, fine tune things in the companies um, and doing that. So that's one of the things that we do and we just kind of like rinse and it's just a rinse and repeat for us, if that makes sense, like doing better and then in, and, and investing in companies and obviously just doing what we're doing. It's a fantastic point on that. Now, I wonder if this is true for you, but I find within myself, if I focus on doing things better and serving the customer better, the money comes. But if I focus Absolutely. on the money, it's like it doesn't come. It's actually the worst thing to be focusing on. If that's the goal. Absolutely. Oh, definitely. And a lot of people think it's a woo-woo thing, like it's a spiritual thing. I mean, I don't really know about that stuff. I mean, there's obviously powers that powers uh, in the world, but I'm not I'm not an expert. I don't think anybody's an expert on that stuff. But I just think it's kind of like common sense. It's like, you know, when I advise young people, it's like you want to be ethical, you want to do the right thing, you don't want to cut corners, you don't want to um, you know, do wrong by people, et cetera, et cetera. It's not because, hey, because you're gonna go to hell. I mean I don't know about that stuff. I don't think anybody else knows about whether you're going to go to hell or not because they haven't been there, I assume. But it's just common sense. You do you, you do wrong by people. Eventually, you do wrong by the wrong person and uh, they'll cut you down at your knees. So you want to be good to everyone. Plus, you want to be able to sleep at night. I think that's a huge thing. You want to be able to be proud. Uh, really cool thing that somebody said to me once is I want, I want to live my life so that when my grandkids Google my name, they can be proud of me. Like that's, that's cool. I like that. That is very cool. I think yeah. people, can you just imagine if people carried around that as a philosophy to live by <laughs> instead of, you know, trying to pay the bills or trying to make yeah, 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 exactly. It's like, imagine that, but imagine you Googled your grandfather and he was like, you ripped off a million people. <laughs> it's like, oh, damn. <laughs> I, I think there's a lot to that though. And even for myself is like, I do not want to get to the top at the expense of others. Yeah, I really, mm, yeah. that's not the attitude we want to bring to life or no, even. No way. Think. It's not worth it. That's like your reputation, your legacy, but how you feel about your life when you look back on it. And it's like, um, Hey, you might have a couple of extra million dollars in the bank, but you don't have any friends. So, you know, that's, that's not cool. Hey, that was me once upon a time. <laughs> <laughs> no, surely we've made that mistake though. I mean, I remember very early on in business that I almost sacrificed every other area of my life. Mm, um, I yeah. didn't hang out with friends. I didn't spend time with family. Like all I did was the business mm -hmm. and it's a pitfall. It's a trap that you can get in court in and you realize at a certain point that it's not actually worth it. Yeah, oh, definitely. I mean, I think that you have to do that to a certain extent. I think that you can't get away with not putting in the hard yards like you can't there's no there's no cutting corners to success you have to put in the work somewhere like people who do you know degree who get degrees have to work a lot to get the degree like maybe they've got to do a six six year degree to get medical degree or something like that if you're in business like if you're a high school dropout which i was i had to work really i had to work 18 18 hours a day i had to read hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of books from start to finish i had to implement I had to make mistakes, learn from them and readjust what I was doing. You, you, you have to work so hard to get to a baseline. You can't shortcut that. And if we see people uh, who, um, who business owners who just start out and they want to do it part time and make a million dollars a year, uh, it's going to take you a long, long time to do that if you're doing it two hours a month or a week. Um, because not only are you not putting the time in, you're not physically committed or emotionally committed to the outcome, uh, it becomes an option. It's like, well, um, you know, if you really want it, then you get it. So if you want to grow a successful company, but you have in the back of your mind, I could just go get a job 
uh, then you won't succeed because you just go, you take the easy route. Every time you take the easy route. Um, so that's in everything, not just business, athletics, sport, professional um, and endeavors, no matter what it is, you have to commit to a certain level. You do have to sacrifice to a certain level. Uh, but obviously I don't agree with um, sacrificing your family relationships and your kids because that's, that's the most valuable thing in the world, uh, more than money. So I know that there's some, uh, I know a guy, I'm not going to mention his name, everyone knows his name uh, in America who, who doesn't see his kids because he's hustle, hustle, hustle. And I'm like, that's, that's really sad. That is really sad. I don't agree with that. So um, I think you have to sacrifice, but you gotta, you got to figure out what you have to sacrifice. Yeah, and that's a really good point. And I feel sorry for that person in a way. I'm not sure that attitude is uh, serving them nonetheless. And that was only a quick dropout this time, Ben. We got you straight back this time, which was <laughs> nice. So I'll bring in one more question and then we will wrap it up. But who are the business owners uh, you admire and look up to these days? Uh, besides you. <laughs> oh, I'm thrilled and honoured you would say that, but besides me. <laughs> Um, I, I guess I've got a bit of a man crush, um, no homo, on Warren Buffett. Um, you know, like, I, re- I think he's the coolest guy ever. He's, like, super nerdy and everything, but I think he's really cool. I look up to him. Uh, I just think he's the um, – he's got great um, values, morals, but he also, he's also extremely smart, successful, and just a downright cool guy. I mean, it'd be, it'd be, he's, like, yeah, he's definitely one of the guys I hold in high esteem. Um, Elon Musk is pretty cool. Uh, I like him, ba- again, based on values, based on the fact that he wants to keep pushing the envelope. He wants to create a better world or a better humanity uh, at, the, at, at the cost of even um, money. I don't think he actually cares that much about being a rich dude. I think he cares more about his, his legacy and impact on, on humanity, which is cool, super cool. Uh, so that's that's really cool too. Um, I can't think of anyone else right now, but that's that's, um, that's pretty much it for now. I think they're two very wise choices and uh, I'm a big fan of both of them as well. And Elon clearly can't be about the money because he could have retired. <laughs> after <PayPal. laughs> exactly. And he's not, it's not like he's making a lot of money out of Tesla right now, but I think that he has a much bigger, bigger vision for humanity. It's kind of like that thing that Warren Buffett says, somebody sitting under, under has shade under a tree because, because of a tree somebody else planted 20 years ago. You know, the person who planted that tree didn't get benefit from it. But without that person planting that tree, that person, that generation 20 years down the track gets to enjoy the benefit. It's like, you know, in 20, 30, 40 years time, we'll have um, great renewable energy technology. We'll have Teslas. We have electric cars. We'll have, you know, maybe, maybe not. We'll be in Mars. It doesn't, I don't know. But we have all these things we could benefit from because of the, the, the tree that he plants today. Can you imagine like leading back to one of your earlier points about, you know, Googling uh, your grandfather? It's like, can you imagine being Elon's uh, grandson and Googling and go, all right, took payments to the internet, got people (laughs) on Mars, sold (laughs) energy prices. Like that's a legacy. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it's great. No, he's done a lot. He's done a lot and he's uh, amazing. And uh, despite all the criticisms, he's still going strong, which is cool. Well, everyone's got haters. I'm still a fan of Elon. So if you, I know he regularly <laughs> listens to the show. So Elon, if you're out there, just I still love you. If we, if you, uh, if you tag his name in the transcript, it'll, pick, it'll be picked up by his PR team. So uh, that's a bit of a pro tip. Hashtag pro tip. Absolutely, we'll try and get him on the show at some point as well. I think would be uh, very, very cool. Hey, why not? Give it a shot. Absolutely. So thank you so much, Ben. It's been an absolute pleasure to have you on the show through it's various internet cr- interruptions, but nonetheless, we worked through. Absolutely. It's, a, it's been an absolute pleasure being on this podcast with you. Thank you so much. So I think we'll have to do a round two at some point. I think we could do a bit of a deep dive on Facebook at another point, but I'm going to be wrapping this one up from here. So thank you so much for being on the show again. This is Confessions of a Business Owner. Hope you're doing all right out there. That is it.